Hello, and welcome to LA Currents. I'm Saida Pagan. More and more Los Angeles residents are reminded that wildfire season isn't just a season anymore. It's all year long. And it brings with it concern, uncertainty, and the possibility of some real serious danger. But there are some steps we can all take to be better prepared. And Los Angeles Fire Chief Ralph Terrazas is here to talk about wildfires and about preparedness. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, let's talk, let's begin with talking about the so-called fire seasons. In the past, we've heard mm -hmm. about the summer fire season and the fall fire season. What are the conditions that are different in each part of the year, and why is it now considered just kind of all in one? Yeah, there's a lot of variables involved with your question there. Uh, we consider brush fires a year-round threat. Uh, we're just coming out of a six-year drought. We had one year of, of heavy rain, which created light fuels, but those dry out too, and they, they dry out pretty quickly. And the third variable, I think, is, is climate change. It's indisputable here that within the Los Angeles region, we're having larger brush fires than we've ever had before. And within the state, they've had six out of the the 10 largest brush fires in the last few years. So that is our new normal. We're always prepared. We ramp up our preparedness as we get towards September because that's the start of our Santa Ana wind uh, season. Usually it starts in September and it lasts through April. So that is our peak time. However, throughout the year, we're susceptible to a brush fire breaking out anywhere in the city of Los Angeles. Absolutely. Now, we also hear about red flag warnings. Can you explain that? Because a lot of times people are new to this area. They, they may not even know what that means. Yeah, if you notice on, on all the news channels, uh, the weather report, uh, the local media has gotten really good about posting red flag alerts. You'll even see the little icon with the red flag uh, waving as if the wind is very strong. The criteria is pretty clear. When relative humidity is below 15%, and the wind speed is 25 miles per hour or above, that's a red flag condition. That means that the ignition uh, for brush is, is higher than normal. When we see the, that number, and we give it a number every day, we call it a brush index, we put additional firefighters on duty in the brush areas of our city. Is that right? Now, what should we be doing or not doing when there is a red flag warning? That is a very, uh, I'm glad you asked that, Nine, well over 90% of our brush fires across the country are caused by humans. And my answer to that would be anything that causes uh, sparks or fire, you should not be doing. Uh, we've had fires start because people were clearing brush using a weed whacker. And the weed whacker uh, created uh, some friction when it hit rocks, created a spark, went into the brush, and a brush fire started. There's, there's multiple causes, but in general, uh, the general public should not do anything that causes uh, sparks or fire. Any other examples of, uh, of that sort of activity? We've recently had fires where a, a trash truck had its load. There was something on fire inside the trash truck, and their protocol is to dump that out into the road. And when that happened recently, it was under red flag conditions. And that heat, something from that fire drifted downwind and started a fire down, down the road. Uh, other things we've had uh, in the Central Valley, uh, uh, high voltage wires drop into the brush, create sparks, ignition starts. We've had fires where campfires were left unattended and the embers from that drifted downwind, created a fire. So there's a, there's a lot of examples of, of human cause of brush fires. And we started to talk about this a few minutes ago, but by all accounts in the past few years, it seems as though the fires have been worse and worse. They've been devastating. Tell us what's happening in more, a little more detail that is causing these fires to be so widespread and it appears so difficult to contain. You're right. These fires in the last few years have been bigger than we've ever had. We had the Latuna fire a few years ago the Creek Fire, the Screwball Fire, uh, and most recently the Saddle Ridge Fire. Basically, it's a combination of those factors I told you earlier. There's the fuel, there's uh, more red flag days, and there's more development into the wildland-urban interface. 
which what I mean by that is that there's more homes, apartment buildings closer into the, the wildland where, there, where the brush threat exists. So it's a combination of all those things and that's what we prepare for year round. Are city planners looking a little bit more closely into perhaps uh, considering developments into these areas? And what is your opinion on that? I think that they are looking at it. I think that there should be some, some more thought given into uh, changing building codes. If you're going to build a home or an apartment complex or a condominium complex into these brush areas, you, they have to be hardened against the threat of a brush fire. Uh, they should have some sprinklers, they should have greater brush clearance, they should have the eaves boxed in. There's a lot of precautions that you can take to prevent your house from burning in a, in a brush fire. Now let's talk uh, about the way fires start. We've mentioned some, but we know that there may be like the top one, two, or three scenarios. Can you walk us through some recent scenarios that you might come to mind about how these out of control fires sometimes start? Yeah, the, the common scenarios, I wish I could tell you exactly what, what that looks like. Uh, every time we have one of these brush fires, these big brush fires, it is human caused. It's very rare. It's, uh, it's a, uh, a natural cause from lightning. That doesn't happen here in the uh, Los Angeles region. So I would say, though, uh, unattended campfires is a big one. Sometimes it's kids playing with matches. Um, and in Central California, and in Northern California, the campfire, it was where a high-powered line dropped into the brush. And because they had such catastrophic wind conditions, the fire traveled very fast and people didn't have a chance to get out. Now we are aware that arson and carelessness are often the causes of fires, but let's talk about some things that we can control, and that is brush clearance. Now we know that there's some laws on the books that tell us what we should and should not be doing. Can you give us a little more clarity on that? Absolutely. In April of each year, we send out a mailer, a brush mailer, letting the people know that they have to clear their parcel. And we mail this to the people that live in the, the brush areas of the city. There's about 134,000 brush parcels in the city of Los Angeles. May 1st, we begin our inspections. Our inspectors go out into the field and, and validate whether or not their parcel has been cleared. This year, we had a compliance rate of about 92% on the first sweep. So we're very, very happy about that. Uh, that helps us uh, be more uh, prepared in case there is a red flag. Um, so basically, 200 feet minimum clearance. We're the most stringent in the state. County has 100 feet. We have double that. Uh, if you want to know more specifics about what you need to do, you can go to our website at lafd.org. There you'll find information like you should trim all the, the tree limbs that hang above your house. You should clear the gutters from, from leaves and uh, pine needles, anything that will ignite. Uh, the major cause of spread is when embers get blown downwind. If it lands in a gutter that's full of dry leaves, it's going to start on fire. So that, those tips and many more tips will be found on that website. That's a wonderful website. I took a look at it. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other resources that are found on that website? There's, there's a lot of information in there. There's a, our Ready, Set, Go program for evacuation ahead of a brush fire. You can learn about our response time by going to Fire Stout LA. You can learn more about our community emergency response team, how to sign up for that. You can get the latest alerts at that website. It has a lot of valuable information. And I also understand from doing a little research that that website can tell, going back to the brush clearance issue, that if your property is in compliance, is that correct? You can go on and, and Absolutely. See that? That's a new feature that we introduced last year. If you're one of those uh, parcel owners that got a notice in the mail, you can check to see how we cleared your property by going to lafd.org and navigate to the brush clearance website, enter your parcel number, and you'll find out whether or not we've cleared your property or not. Now let's talk a little bit now about homeless encampments. We're not criticizing in any way, but tell us about the fire danger with regards, potential for fire danger with homeless encampments. There is a potential. We, the Skirball fire was, was caused by an encampment along the uh, 
405 freeway near UCLA. Uh, last year, actually a few months ago, city council changed the ordinance, which now allows uh, LAPD to remove people that are living in the brush area without 24-hour posting of that property. So uh, when you have a red flag condition, you don't want to wait 24 hours. You want to get people out of harm's way so that we can prevent these fires from occurring. Let's now turn to the topic of preparedness. Now we know that even if you're doing everything right, anybody can get caught in a wildfire, any fire. So let's talk about what we should be doing now mm -hmm. to be prepared. Chief. Well, first thing you should do is sign up for all the alerts. Uh, notify LA alert. You can, anybody can sign up for it. And you can do that by texting 888-777. So when you're having a big event, it could be brush fire, earthquake, active shooter, whatever the, the incident type may be, you'll get alerted of that notification. Uh, beyond that, if we're talking brush fires, you should have your brush clearance done. That's the first thing. You need to have that done. Mm -hmm. You need to know the, the roads of egress two different directions because you never know where the fire is coming from. You so that's an, excuse me, that's an, an escape route. Escape route, exactly. Okay. Uh, that's the ready part. The set part is to get all your, when you're aware of a, of a oncoming brush fire, get the things that you want to take ready. Put them in your car, like your prescriptions, uh, money, medi uh, I said medications, pet food if you have pets, your phone charger. There's a lot of things on our website that will help you prepare. Now you want to put that in your car and you want to be ready to go. The third step is go. When you're told to go, evacuate. Do not linger. If in doubt, leave early versus leaving late. And more information can be found at LAFD.org. Now that's at your home. What about at work? And what should you have at work? What should you have in your car? Any emergency? You mentioned uh, documents, etc. Any other things in your emergency pack? Well, there's there's not so much for brush fires, but I think <laughs> uh, earthquake preparedness. There's some probably some things you could purchase. We do have some disaster kits uh, identified on the uh, LAFD.org website. Basic first aid stuff. Uh, basic uh, gloves, uh, basic tools. If you take the community emergency response training, you'll get 17 and a half hours of training and you'll know how to use these things, how to shut off utilities, how to, how to help others who may need some basic first aid. So you can never be too prepared, especially in the city of Los Angeles. Now, once that wildfire has broken out, I know from personal experience that sometimes it's confusing as to what to do because you hear conflicting media reports, your neighbors are saying one thing. What, tell us what we really should be, what should be going through our minds when this happens. I know you address this a little bit, but let's take it step by step so we know that the fire is advancing and you're trying to monitor media reports but not sure if they're accurate, up to date, that kind of thing. Well, basically what you're describing is what we uh, train all our firefighters is to enhance your situational awareness. Now, the best way the public can do that is to go to our website, LAFD.org. Um, and I have to reemphasize that point I made earlier. Sign up for the alerts. The Notify LA alert will give you advance warning, and that will direct you to LAFD.org, which has the evacuation uh, maps and a brief description of whatever incident uh, may be occurring. In addition to all of that, we're using the wireless emergency alert system. So if you're uh, in that impacted area, we put a geofence around that and you'll get a message on your cell phone. It's, you don't have to sign up for that. That's going to be automatic from us. So there's multiple redundant ways to get situational awareness, notify LA, the wireless emergency alert system, and by monitoring media. Now when a person knows that they should evacuate. How does that occur? Do, do firefighters go into the neighborhood or tell us how that works? It depends how much time we have. Uh, sometimes there's not enough time and we want people to shelter in place. Stay in your homes. We're going to make a defense uh, right here. If there's time, we're going to use LAPD to get out in advance of the fire and to evacuate people. We did that at the Saddle Ridge fire. So it, it depends on the incident characteristics on, on terms of what type of evacuation mode we will take. 
you'll either shelter in place or need to leave. Now, after the fire is over and in the event that your home is destroyed, what kind of help or assistance might there be for people in that terrible situation? That is a very difficult situation. Uh, many people have never experienced uh, a loss of their home. Uh, so in that area, once again, if we go to LAFD.org, there is disaster recovery information. We do have an emergency preparedness handbook in there. It's very detailed about how to go about making a claim with your insurance adjuster, what the Red Cross can do for you on a temporary basis. Uh, we try to help you, the firefighters do, by passing out save cards. These cards are worth $250 each and help pay for immediate needs like immediate lodging or, or food. So if you go to the website, uh, there'll be good information on how to proceed with a claim. And we were talking before about the free classes that the fire department offers. Can you give us some detail as to what you would learn in this class and how you would sign up for it? Absolutely. The Community Emergency Response Team is a 17 and a half hour course that they present over a period of seven weeks. And they cover area, areas such as basic first aid, how to shut down utilities, how to assist the fire department in uh, large scale disasters. Uh, during the Northridge earthquake, I had uh, some CERT volunteers uh, knock on the door of, of my fire station. And I put them to work. And what they did is walk up and down streets uh, shutting off gas lines when they saw or heard a leak. So go to our website at LAFD.org and you can find more information about it and you'll learn how to sign up for it. Now let's go back to the firefighting activities and the equipment that you have. I understand there's some good news in that you have some new equipment. I believe there is a handheld device that allows firefighters to see in smoke filled rooms or areas more easily. Tell us about that equipment and your aerial equipment and what you have in place now for your firefighting needs. Absolutely. The thermal imager camera, we had one large camera about this size and the captain would hold on to it when uh, they would go inside a structure. And um, in March of this year, we purchased a, a thousand of these cameras and they're about the size of your cell phone. And every on-duty firefighter has a tick thermal image or camera. What the tick allows you to do is to go into a, a home or a, or a large warehouse with zero visibility and you can use the tick to find trapped victims or to find a way out if you get detached from our hose line. Our hose line is our traditional means of our connection to the outside. If, if you're in a bad situation, you find the hose line and then crawl out. Well, now the tick We'll, we'll see that. You'll see the differential in temperature because it's all about heat uh, temperatures. The tick allows us to increase firefighter safety as well as the ability to find people, sometimes kids, who are hiding in a zero uh, visibility environment. Let's talk about the use of drones with your department. Drones are something that we brought into the department about three years ago. And we had to develop policy to ensure that uh, uh, our commissioners and the public were, were uh, secure with how they would be used. And that's, that's happened. Uh, we use drones for training. We use drones for incidents like uh, in a brush fire. We'll wait like in the later phases of it to find the hot spots that exist. When I can fly a drone instead of a helicopter, it saves the hours that we put on the helicopter's motor because after they reach 100 hours, they have to go in for maintenance and the fuel that we burn and then the, the fatigue on the pilots. So the drones have been a great uh, addition to our capabilities. They do have infrared. Infrared allows us to find those hot spots and they become a, a great tool for the fire department. Any other equipment that you'd like to discuss and let the public know that you have in place? Now we have things like the automated vehicle locator system. So now we know where all our units are by looking on a screen and we're able to track their physical location. Uh, we have the Wi-Fi technology that allows us to predict where brush fires are gonna travel within minutes. Uh, we're connected to Pulse Point so the member of the public can download the Pulse Point app and be alerted when we're responding to an incident where, where they live. 
The most recent addition to our fleet in terms of brush fires has been the helicopters. We got two new helicopters in the last two years. Two years. It's the Augusta uh, AW-139. And the helicopter uh, effectiveness on brush fires is critical. Now we have five of these medium-sized helicopters that we can immediately deploy if we feel that we have a, a significant brush threat. In the most recent fire, the, the Saddle Ridge fire, we immediately launched all our available helicopters. We do have a leased helitanker uh, for us between August and uh, January. And we have access to two super scoopers that are here starting uh, September to the end of the year. Chief, let's talk about the helipad over at the Olive View Center. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening there? The Olive View helipad was reopened a few months ago, and it was destroyed in the Sayre Fire of 2008, I believe. Uh, it was very good timing because we use that helipad at the uh, Saddle Ridge Fire. That allows us the capability to have uh, up to four helicopters refueled or, or um, adding water to their, their water tanks uh, at the same time. Uh, the helipad is right behind all of you hospital. It was a great location and it was a true partnership between the city and county of LA to provide the funds to reopen that helipad. So we're very grateful for the, the support there and uh, hopefully we won't need to use it again for a while, but it was very valuable in fighting the Saddle Ridge Fire. You have a really tough job and you're doing a wonderful job with everything that you're fighting the fires, et cetera. What more does your department need in terms of resources, in terms of equipment, and then public education? Well, thank you. Yeah, I have to say that uh, we're in a very good position right now because of Mayor Garcetti's support, our city council, and our fire commission. We've received uh, record-setting budgets in the last five years. That's allowed us to catch up with our staffing our apparatus, our helicopter fleet. Uh, we've enhanced our technology. Uh, I think our greatest need right now is something we're contemplating putting on the ballot next year, a fire station bond. Our fire station infrastructure is very old and we have some needs at certain fire stations to replace them, to make them bigger, to make uh, them more effective and efficient. Our skid row station needs to be replaced it's too small because of the call load activity in Skid Row is so high. We need to put more resources in that fire station, but we can't because it's too small. And it was built many, many years ago. We have another station in Westwood that was built uh, around World War II. It's uh, deteriorating. Um, so there's examples like that throughout the city and uh, be looking for a bond initiative next year sometime. Now we talked about what the fire department needs to do its job, and it's doing a great job. But let's talk about how the rest of us, the public, can support the fire department. You have what is called an Adopt-A-Station program. Tell us about that. Many, many years ago, in the, probably the, the early 90s, uh, communities uh, got behind their local station and started contributing money to provide enhancements at the fire station and weight equipment, cardiovascular, stair masters, that kind of thing. Uh, over the years, it's morphed into our foundation, our LAFD Fire Foundation. That now has taken that program over, and uh, people can donate to the foundation, and the foundation will provide requests at the fire station level for things like exercise equipment, sometimes tools and equipment for the fire trucks, um, refrigerators, industrial washers for our turnout coats that need to be washed after a structure fire. That's a big uh, effort in itself. We call them extractors. So if anybody's interested in supporting the LAFD, they can go to our, our foundation at supportlafd.org. Let's talk a little bit about the Saddle Ridge fire. Tell us the scope of it and can you give, bring us up to date on what's happening? Absolutely. Last week, it was a Thursday night about 9 o'clock, I was at home watching the news. And I saw the uh, report of the fire, and I saw a visual from a news helicopter. And we had already been pre-deploying additional firefighters because of the weather. We knew it was a bad um, brush index, which means a high threat of a brush fire. Uh, when I saw that visual image, I thought we were going to lose several hundred homes because of the wind and where it was at. 
in Silmar. It started in Silmar, a lot of brush in that area, and it was, it was blowing towards the southwest. So we activated uh, everything that we've been preparing for, for year-round on brush fires. We had our pre-deployed resources. We started initiating the, the wireless emergency alerts and the notify LA alerts. We got um, mutual aid from our partners, LA County Fire Department and Cal Fire and Angeles uh, National Forest Firefighters. Um, we um, were able to mitigate that incident. We lost 17 homes. We saved thousands. We lost 17 homes, and the loss of one home is a big disappointment. Um, historical fires, uh, we had a fire there in that area in 2008. We call it the Sayre Fire. We lost 500 homes. So I'm very proud of our firefighters to save the thousands that they did save, and we're always looking to see how can we do better next time. This week, we'll be doing some after-action meetings to have discussions about what can we do better. We do that every time there's a major incident to self-critique how we performed. I'm very proud that we did a very good job. Did anything come to mind as you looked and said, well, what, what, what we could do better? Is there anything that came to mind as you Well, I'm, as pleased, you I'm pleased to say that there's no major area where I thought we had a failure. I think it's an incremental improvement on everything that we're already doing. The technology is continuing to get better. We use a thing called Wi-Fi. White Fire uh, projects the path of a fire using real-time weather information, known fire corridors, and existing uh, brush indicators. Um, and we validate that with a program we call FIRUS. And FIRUS basically is two fixed-wing aircraft who fly above the helicopters around the perimeter of the brush fire and validate the path of the fire. Once we know that, we can project which areas, if any, need to be evacuated which we load down on LAFD.org so when the public gets this alert, they can go to the map knowing that that information is as accurate as possible. Well, thank you for doing a wonderful job for saving so many homes and so many lives in Los Angeles. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very proud of the men and women of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. I believe we're the finest fire department in the world, and I say that on a regular basis because I truly believe that. And we're that way because of the people that we have. We have a great group of men and women who are dedicated professionals, dedicated to the safety of the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. It's been great having you on our program. And thank you for joining us for this edition of LA Currents. I'm Saida Pagan.